Hello everyone, this is Final Voice TV. We come your way with another narrative about Africa. We tell the Africa stories so that we all know what we can do to help the various countries in Africa and Africa at large. Today I ask you a simple question. Have you read George Orwell's Animal Farm book? Let me take you to chapter 7 of the book. And Orwell said, It was a bitter winter. In quote, It was a bitter winter that the animals had no source of energy and it was getting colder. So the animals made a frantic effort to generate electricity by using windmill. Is George Orwell a prophet? Did he know what was ahead of Europeans or the world? Because Orwell was telling us about our future, the impending crisis. As we speak today, Germany is in Africa searching for energy. As we speak today, Russia is almost cutting the supply of energy to Central Europe. Was this what George Orwell was referring to? Was this what Orwell referred to as it was a better winter? And therefore, we need to make frantic efforts to get energy, something sustainable. Mm -hmm. Something sustainable. Yes, you may have the energy, but mm -hmm. it might not be what? Sustainable. True. And that is the case of Germany and other nations now in Europe. What can Africa learn from these mistakes? I mean, what can we do when it comes to energy? Welcome on the show, Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Charles. Yeah, guests would like to hear from you. What can Africa learn? from Europe's energy crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going for a break. Mm -hmm. When I return, mm -hmm. we continue with our discussion. If you're watching me now, what you can do is to subscribe. Mm -hmm. Kindly subscribe, like this video and share. And what matters to me most is your comment. Leave a comment in the comment section. What can Africa learn from Europe's energy crisis? We are using Germany as a case study. I'll be right back. Yeah, so Mr. Mitchell, we look at the energy crisis in Europe. Mm -hmm. We all know it, it, it causes, I mean, what is causing the energy crisis in Europe now, I mean, the impending energy crisis. Mm -hmm. They are yet to see total darkness, mm -hmm. but the signs are clear mm -hmm. that if Germany and other nations do not act quickly, they may see total blackout mm -hmm. in winter. Yeah, true. That is somebody's case. That is a case of Germany. Mm -hmm. But what can Africans learn from the energy crisis in Europe? Okay. Uh, thanks, Mr. Charles, for um, the very interesting introduction that actually looks into this issue of um, George Orwell's uh, animal farm. And so it was a bitter winter. And hopefully we will not have a bitter winter and um, the situation is actually uh, corrected. So looking to your question, um, how, what can we learn, the lessons that actually we get from this energy crisis? So the first thing that we can actually learn is that uh, there are good times and there are bad times. So by this, what I mean is in the good times, uh, the plan was... Uh, Germany actually gets uh, its gas, its oil from Russia. They had actually uh, made a, a gas pipeline from Russia, I think about 1,400 kilometers, and uh, that was called Nord Stream 1. They even constructed a second one, um, which was set for commissioning just prior to the conflict between uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine. So what we see here is, during the good times, this is what happened. Oh. But then there were other voices that had actually pointed out that, um, you know, we should not be overly re reliant on the energy from Russia. 
but unfortunately that voice was, was actually not listened to. And so in the good times, they, they just planned for the good times, mm. that ah, things are going well, we shall be getting our gas from, from Russia. So, so that's one lesson that we actually learned, that you actually need to plan for also the bad times. So in this case... You just don't risk putting all your eggs in one basket. In one basket, yeah, that's true. Because in this case, uh, they were actually going on to the second pipeline. And uh, now it, it actually appears the first um, pipeline was actually the, the uh, amount of gas coming through was reduced to about 20%. And that is actually at a time when winter is approaching and much of the energy is actually uh, required. So that's the, uh, the first lesson that we actually learn. And then um, in the same token, we are saying that we should actually plan for uh, the, the worst case. And uh, connected to this same point is this aspect that I hinted to earlier, that there were some voices. There were think tanks, research institutions that had actually looked into this whole issue of relying on energy from Russia and given advice, particularly to Germany, that they should not go in this uh, direction of uh, a pipeline from Russia. But unfortunately, these voices were, were not listened to. So the point that we make here is that in Africa, it's also unfortunate that we also do not have so many of these uh, think tanks. And the uh, few that we have, most of the governments sometimes actually do not follow the advice that comes from the think tanks. That, well, that's for various reasons. Some of the think tanks are actually sponsored by uh, foreign or international um, organizations. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the governments are a bit uh, suspicious of the motives or behind the advice. But... That would then point to a second thing that, as Africa, we should actually have our own think tanks that we actually sponsor and they do the research for us and we should be willing to listen to the voices that uh, they uh, give from time to time. So the voice of research and research is a really important aspect that we actually probably do not quite have in Africa. So you'll find that most of the time uh, information is required and we do not have the source for, 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 for this information. So it's like we do not really put most of our stuff in, in writing, as it were. And then um, we also notice this other issue that we also observe during this whole crisis, is that Europe has tended to go back to the fossil fuels that we were all running away from. Mm. So at one point... Uh, there are a lot of African countries with vast quantities of coal and uh, they have uh, thermal power stations that they were actually using for, for their energy. And then the coal had been made that we actually transition from the fossil fuels to renewable energy. And it seemed the uh, voice was going out loud and clear. And um, all of a sudden, to see those people who actually... Um, had actually proposed that we, we, we move from the fossil fuels. Now going back to the same fossil fuels is actually a betrayal of um, African countries because now it appears like it's a double standard mm. really. Mm. So this is another thing that we also learned that um, we could actually probably use this uh, in, 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 in future discussions. But anyway, the point is we are not quite sure for how long they will actually be using these um, coal power plants. Mm. But um, safe to say that uh, hopefully it's a very, very short time. They've, they've said maybe up to April 2023, but we, who knows what happens then. And probably because April we are moving into summer, so probably that's, that's the reasoning that uh, the energy requirements would have actually uh, have reduced. But uh, it's just a betrayal the same. So this is at least something that we actually learn. And one would wonder if, if the, uh, the other side of the coin, if it was Africa in this same situation, mm -hmm. what, 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 how would it have uh, how would it unfolded? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these are things that we are actually uh, uh, learning. And, and so the other thing that uh, we also see is, uh, like you pointed out, that this you do not have to put all your eggs in one basket. So... We, we realize in Africa... Especially if it comes to energy. Yes, in energy mm -hmm. issues, yes. So what we mean here by uh, putting all your eggs in one basket, I've been talking about um, thermal power, for instance, and we have been overly relying on, power, on thermal power. 
And now of late, there are also some countries that have come up with uh, hydropower, for example. Mm -hmm. But we've noticed, like what we saw in Zimbabwe, 2017, there uh, was a drought, and um, the water levels actually in the dams actually went down, particularly at uh, Lake Kariba, let's say, in Zimbabwe. And um, when the water levels went down, even the generating capacity also went down. And this has been linked to climate change. And, and many countries in Africa rely on hydro yes. power. So the, the issue is then if climate change uh, projections go the way they are with these er erratic rainfall patterns, it actually means that even the power generating capacity of our uh, hydropower stations can actually go down. So if we are putting all our eggs in the hydropower, mm -hmm. it means that we can actually lose out. So we have to diversify our energy mix to include uh, other renewable energy, uh, be it uh, solar energy, be it uh, wind energy, and we diversify the mix. All right. Yes. So it was a better winter, as Orwell said in his book. What lessons can Africa learn from Europe's experience? Mm. What can we learn from Europe in terms of the impending energy crisis? in Europe. A big nations, Germany and others, are in Africa searching for energy. They've been to Nigeria, Morocco, and other countries. Do we sit or do we wait for the worst to happen before we act as a people of a continent? Should hydropower be the only source of energy? In Africa, yes, some countries have made efforts when it comes to solar energy, mm -hmm and others, but there are more to be tapped into. Mm -hmm. Going for a break, when I return, Mr. Mitchell tells us more. What you can do now is to subscribe, like, and share this video. Leave a comment. My concern is a comment. Let's discuss something about the energy issues in Africa. I'll be right back. This is Final Voice TV. It's about the energy issues in Africa. What are we waiting for? Some countries do not even have full connections when it comes to energy. Energy is only, uh, is only in the major cities. Mm -hmm. You go to the rural areas and there are no electrification projects. Mm -hmm. So, what if the worst happens? Do we wait and see what big nations in Europe are going through now? It was a bitter winter. George Orwell prophesied in the 40s mm. that animals made frantic effort to generate electricity by using a windmill. Mm. Frantic effort is the phrase here. What can we do, I mean, holistically, uh, people of the continent, Africa, mm -hmm. what do you think uh, we can do to avert any future uh, crisis? Right. Um, when we look at the whole uh, nation of Africa, I think you mentioned this aspect of uh, many places actually not having uh, energy. So the issue of energy is really critical for Africa. And without energy, truly, we cannot, um, we cannot develop. So I was just thinking of one example that actually is uh, pertinent to, uh, to Nigeria, for example. So of late, I was just going through some uh, literature on energy, and I actually came across an interesting um, information that the, the grid in Nigeria has actually collapsed 200 times in, in a space of a year. So that shows how serious this issue of uh, energy is. But coming back to your question, where you are looking at what can be done uh, in, in the continent of Africa. So one thing we realized from the situation in Europe is that when they noticed this um, pending crisis with energy, they actually sat down as the EU to see how exactly they can actually come up with measures to, to, to affect the um, crisis. So what it actually then shows is there is actually so many aspects to this. So there's this first angle of the citizens of Europe. They are so much concerned about their citizens, so much that they have to have, like, you know, the EU parliament deliberating on this very important topic. Oh. So 
First of all, they meet, they have the concern for their citizens. And this is what we would also want to see in Africa, that our heads of government have actually this concern for their citizens to have energy throughout and not just in the cities, as you mentioned. Right. So that was just one aspect. And then the second aspect of them working together is that then they solve the problem, not just, you know, in piecemeal approach, but it actually helps even to uh, have what we call um, uniform prices, for mm -hmm. instance. So if they go as the EU to Morocco, to Nigeria, and they buy the gas at the same time, it means that the gas is coming to the EU under that uh, umbrella of EU. And therefore, the price is more or less the same. Imagine if uh, France goes to buy uh, and followed by Germany, followed by, you know, how the prices then, the variations would be working up. And so we actually notice that this working together is actually uh, a good thing. And this is something that we can also learn from uh, how they have actually managed the, uh, the situation. Yeah. Uh, if you're watching me now, I show you satellite images of Africa at night and compare that to the same images at night with regard to Europe. So I'll show you, let's say, Europe and Africa at night. And you could see that Africa is in total darkness. We're already in darkness. Mm. Should we wait for the worst to happen? Uh, don't you think this is also another business um, of opportunity for, for Africa? Because we have the natural resources, mm -hmm. the, the gas. Mm -hmm. I mean, anything that you need to generate energy. Yes. Many of them come mm -hmm. from Africa. Lithium, mm -hmm. I mean, the LPG gas, and many others are from Africa. Don't you think this is the hour? that uh, Africa needs to uh, maximize profit from mm -hmm. its uh, energy uh, resources or what have you? Yeah, uh, thank you for that very interesting and very important uh, point, Mr. Charles. So um, I think there's an expression that they use in English, that you should keep your eyes on the ball. Mm. So it, it looks like we have not been <laughs> keeping our eyes on the ball because now if we had been proactive, really looking at how things are unfolding, right? For instance, we know that um, with, 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 with all these renewable energies, you need space. And space is something that the EU actually doesn't have. So we should be actually positioning ourselves, right? It's just like in football. You, you, you see that your striker is going on the left, uh, uh, left side and you, you, you position yourself so that you score the, the goal. So we have been noticing the, the, the signs mm -hmm. that, okay, they've come to a saturation point in terms of uh, renewable energy. Mm -hmm. So this should actually be the time for Africa. So Africa should be angling itself so that it can then um, be in a position not only to uh, power Africa, but also to export its energy mm -hmm. uh, throughout Europe as well as uh, other countries. Okay. And the opportunity definitely is still there. We have seen, like you mentioned earlier, that uh, the EU has actually come to Africa and is looking for uh, energy through gas, through, um, through even oil. Mm -hmm. Though, of course, we want to go the route of, uh, of, of renewable energy. Mm -hmm. But even then... Uh, we have the opportunity of uh, producing hydrogen using uh, renewable energy sources from, from the solar that we've been talking about. We make the hydrogen, and this hydrogen can actually be stored and be exported to other countries. And in the process, these are the jobs that we are talking about when we say green jobs in Africa, which could actually employ millions of people. So definitely the opportunity for Africa is now. The issue is... We need to um, focus uh, in the long term what are the opportunities that, uh, that align themselves and that we could actually take advantage of. Yeah. What else can we uh, share when it comes to uh, what Africa can do about impending energy crisis? Right. So um, in, in my view, the, the next step that uh, we could actually take uh, was this aspect of commercializing uh, enterprises to do with uh, renewable energy, for example. And uh, we could also let our citizens take charge because currently what we have is a situation where most uh, electricity enterprises are state-owned. 
and state managed. And we know how, you know, the bureaucracy that we have with uh, state-owned uh, enterprises and how inefficient they are also at the same time. So we actually need to open up this space to other players. We have seen what is happening in, in, in Europe. So we have uh, renewable energy cooperatives, for instance, where ordinary citizens put forward their resources and uh, they're actually powering much of uh, Europe and have helped uh, significantly the transition from uh, fossil fuels to, uh, to renewable energy. So opening up the, the space for just ordinary citizens to take part also, the state could then come up with some innovative ways to support this. And uh, definitely it should go a long way to not only power Africa, but even also to um, enable Africa to export energy to other countries. Africa's energy situation, lessons from Europe. What can we learn from the Russia-Ukraine war that has impacted Central Europe so much that countries, big countries in Central Europe, are now roaming around searching for energy? Because they know they cannot let their citizens be in darkness. Because they know they have businesses, factories, companies that rely on the national grid and therefore these active leaders in Europe do whatever they want to do or what they can do to get their people energy. What are our leaders in Africa doing? Using Germany or Russia Ukraine war as a test case, what will happen to some of the countries in Africa if we, have, we see some of the countries that provide energy mm -hmm. in, in, in war. Mm -hmm. Ghana rely on Nigeria for LPG gas. And countries around Ghana rely on Ghana for electricity. Mm -hmm. So in case there is a major war, mm. what will these nations do? Mm -hmm. Why don't we tap into the resources that we, we have mm -hmm. and provide more energy? The situation in Europe even uh, justifies that Africa has reached its uh, business potential. Mm -hmm. We can produce more energy and sell to Europe. Mm -hmm. What are we waiting for as a people of a continent? This is Final Voice TV. I'm going for a break, I'll be right back. So, it's about energy issues in Africa. Taking lessons from Europe. <clears throat> yeah. uh, if nothing at all, Russia, Ukraine war and its impact on Central Europe. Uh, what else can we learn, or what do you add? Right. Perhaps uh, your, final, your, your final submission. Uh, thank you, Mr. Charles. I think my final submissions actually border around investment in the issues of uh, energy. And uh, there are some studies, in particular one, I think it's um, Power Up Africa, I think that's the name of the project, uh, that is actually being funded by the African Development Bank. And they actually estimate that the, uh, the power needs for Africa are as high as almost one trillion uh, United States dollars. And th th this would actually help to power up the whole of Africa. But then um, the issue is on the funding. So the African Development Bank has only availed just about 15 billion of this one trillion. <laughs> so you can imagine... Uh, the, the deficit that we actually have so that we can get to one trillion. But um, it all de be begins with a plan. So the good thing is the plan is there. But what is needed now is this working together that we've been talking about and uh, seeing some innovative ways in which we can actually then power up uh, the, the whole of Africa. So like we actually mentioned uh, in the discussion, there are many things that we can actually learn uh, from the incidents that have, uh, the crisis that have um, unfolded in Europe. And uh, working together is actually one of the, the uh, issues that we pointed out. There's always power in unity. Uh, before we end, don't you think it's, big, it's a big business for some people just by keeping their citizens or just by keeping the whole nation in darkness? Don't you think people make money out of that because? Well, it, 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 because if not that, mm -hmm. if that's not the situation, mm -hmm. what is solar panel? 
-hmm. It's actually a panel that receives energy from the sun. Mm -hmm. And you and I know that Africa has that energy. Mm -hmm. yep. The sun smites us mm -hmm. than any other continent. <laughs> yeah. Maybe in India and other countries in the Middle East, they also, let's say, Qatar and thereabout, they also mm -hmm. experience the same. Uh, let's say those in the tropics. Mm -hmm. Tropics is the right word. Mm -hmm. They also have similar heat wave and energy. Mm -hmm. So the issue is why can't we provide the people with more solar panels? Mm -hmm. For them to even get energy for small gadgets in their homes. Mm -hmm. What are we waiting for? I think it's somebody's duty, it is somebody's lifestyle to keep majority of the people in darkness. Mm. Okay, that's an interesting uh, look at the situation. But I think uh, it's a really poor way of doing business. Because look at it this way. Uh, I'll give you statistics from, uh, from Zimbabwe, for instance. We have, uh, I'm not quite sure as of now, but I remember when I once did another study, the, um, the local uh, electricity supply authority only had as much as about 500 to 600,000 people on its account, right? In a population of around 12, 13 million. Mm -hmm. So you, 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 can cons you can look at this. It's actually not business sense that you only have 500,000 customers when you can actually have more. So, um, yeah, it, 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 it could be, like you say, that uh, some people actually would benefit somehow in, in, in keeping people away from power. But if you look at it also on another level, it actually would then help even the government itself can actually get revenue from um, taxes, etc. So the more people that are actually all connected to the grid, it's actually even business. Because now you look at, uh, we're talking about rural empowerment. We, we are talking about jobs in the rural areas, if all the areas are actually connected to the grid. And more business in the rural areas actually means more taxes. So it actually widens the tax base, unlike how it is currently, that it's mostly people in urban areas who participate in, in economic activity. Yeah, because I, I said that because look at a country like Nigeria. Mm -hmm. They have everything. Everything as in the sense of resources that can generate energy. Mm -hmm. Like I mentioned um, earlier, mm -hmm. Ghana even buys LPG mm -hmm. from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. But go check the statistics of people who are in darkness mm -hmm. in Nigeria mm -hmm. and you'll be marveled. Mm -hmm. It's quite overwhelming. Yeah, sure, that's true. And all that people do in that country is to import plants and generators. These are being done by the leaders, the so-called rich men, who could seek the service of think tanks, who could, who could invest in the energy sector of, 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 of Nigeria. Mm. They don't do this. What they do is to import plants and generators. Mm. So who is to fix the problem? <laughs> when that problem is fixed, I will not get my money. Mm -hmm. So I keep you in darkness mm. whilst I make money. Not only in Nigeria, in mm -hmm. many countries in Africa. Mm -hmm. It's someone's business. Mm -hmm. People milk people just by keeping them in darkness and importing plants and generators mm -hmm. from elsewhere. This is Final Voice. This is where we draw curtains on today's show. Mm -hmm. Africa has a lot of lessons to learn from Europe's, um, Europe's experience. Just this year, countries in the EU are chasing countries in Africa for energy. It's a wake-up call mm. to countries in Africa. It's a wake-up call that we need to boost our energy sector. It's a wake-up call that we should not play with the resources that provide energy or that, we, that uh, help us to generate energy for our people. Final Voice TV, we end here.